Hi everyone, I'm Peter Chu, a urologist from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Welcome again to the Asian series of Grand Rants in Urology. This is a series of talks by a group of Asian experts to talk about important urology topics from an Asian perspective. And today we are very honored to have Professor Sun Jun Oh to share with us some tips and tricks on home immunoclation of prostate. Professor Oh is a professor of urology at Seoul National University College of Medicine in Seoul, South Korea. And over the past 25 years, Professor Oh has authored or co-authored over 220 peer-reviewed papers and contributed to 16 book chapters, including one chapter in the ninth edition of Campbell's Urology. He was also the principal investigator in more than 100 different research on the lower urinary tract dysfunction areas, and his primary interest is in BPH, overactive bladder, and neuropathic lower urinary tract dysfunction. And he's also interested in research on the urodynamic aspects of bladder outflow obstruction associated with BPH and also in whole lab, of course. He has been the president of the Korean Continent Society since 2016 and also served as president of the Pan Pacific Continent Society. So without further ado, uh, I would like to invite Professor Oh to give his lecture today on sphincter saving technique in whole lab surgery. Thank you, Professor Oh. Thank you very much. Uh for your uh, kind introduction and also the uh, invitation to this wonderful online symposium. Um, I'm very happy to have uh, this chance to share my uh, experience with you on my sphincter saving technique in whole lab. Uh, in this lecture, I will explain the basic uh, surgical anatomy of the urethral sphincter first, and then I will present you my core surgical concept in whole lab. Uh, last, I will show you my surgical technique using my surgery video. These core concepts of a whole lab surgical technique can be applied in the same way to other enucleation techniques using different energy sources such as uh, tulium, bipolar, and so on. Collectively, uh, whole lab technique is currently ex expanded as a part of a, a anatomical endoscopic enucleation of prostate or AEEP. Uh, as you all know, whole lab is becoming a more universally accepted transurethral surgery for BPH. Uh, this uh, enucleation technique has many advantages compared to other conventional methods of prostatectomy, uh, such as less bleeding, shorter hospital uh, stay, and shorter catheter indwelling time, and uh, most importantly, the independence of the adenoma size. Uh, above all, the greatest advantage of a whole lab surgery is that uh, it has the same surgical principle as an open prostatectomy. Uh, we can remove uh, prostatic adenoma as radically as possible. But this means that surgery is performed more closely to the sphincter side in whole lab than uh, TRP. Uh, therefore, uh, urinary incontinence is uh, one of the most serious complications of a whole lab. Let's look at the instance of urinary incontinence post-operatively. Uh, the instance varies greatly uh, among different authors and also the method of evaluation, but it is generally reported to be around 5 to 6% uh, at post-operative six months. Uh, ideology of uh, stress urinary incontinence after whole lab is uh, known to be uh, multifactorial. It includes age, uh, general health status of the patient, uh, presence of a neurological disease and uh, accompanying uh, bladder dysfunction, and so on. Above all, we must consider a high degree of individual variation in the anatomy of the prostate apex. The difference in anatomy can include factors such as length, shape, or thickness of the sphincter, uh, extent of a straight sphincter inside the prostatic apex. Uh, I will introduce four concepts of ideas related to the anatomy of the urethral sphincter. First, uh, this, uh, it is reported that uh, there is uh, too much individual variation in the sphincter itself. Uh, especially at the prostate apical area. You see uh, this picture published in the uh, European Urology in 2011. Uh, you can see the extent and thickness, length, 
shape of the urethral sphincter is very different from patient to patient. Uh, this means that sometimes it is very difficult for surgeon to apply the same surgical technique to get perfect continence. Uh, another finding we can get uh, is that the amount of the sphincter muscle in the anterior part or endoscopically it's a, a 12 o'clock position at the prostate apex varies greatly depending on the individual. Uh, Therefore, when performing the whole left surgery, you know, very careful attention uh, should be paid to the 12 o'clock direction uh, of the prosthetic apex. Uh, second, the urethral sphincter does not have the same shape in the anterior and posterior prosthetic apex. Rather, it has a horseshoe shape or uh, with the posterior side being thinned out and more sphincteric tissue in the anterior prostate. Another apical, anterior uh, uh, apical tissue forms so-called uh, anterior fibromuscular stroma with uh, uh, abundant uh, elastic connective tissue. Therefore, now we can see that the 12 o'clock side at the uh, prostate apical portion is the most important area in order to preserve continence. Uh, next, I'd like to mention the importance of a uh, urethral mucosal coaptation mechanism in maintaining urinary continence. Uh, we all know that uh, urethral mucosa and the vascular subendothelial tissue contain rich uh, elastic tissue. Therefore, uh, urethral mucosa is very important in maintaining uh, urinary continence. Uh, it provides a sealing effect or coaptation effect to the uh, urethral lumen. Uh, old postmenopausal women are prone to be uh, very vulnerable to urinary incontinence as hormonal change in this age may, may induce mucosal atrophy. In the same way as uh, urethral coaptation mechanism can be damaged due to uh, urethral surgery, fibrosis or scarring occurs in the urethral mucosal area. Uh, this sealing effect may not be sufficient in this region, resulting in uh, urinary incontinence. Last, uh, identification of urethral sphincter at uh, 12 o'clock position endoscopically is uh, not easy. Many surgeons describe the location of uh, uh, sphincter at uh, 12 o'clock position as just uh, opposite to the uh, Vermontanum, but uh, practically there is no clear landmark for it. The uh, local anatomy of a uh, uh, sphincter is not consistent. Endoscopically, it's uh, difficult for a surgeon to exactly localize urethral sphincter at 12 o'clock position endoscopically. Uh, with all these in mind, I have applied the sphincter anatomy to my surgery. During the last uh, 13 years, I modified my surgical technique little by little to reach the current uh, surgical technique. Now I have a clinical outcome with a very few patients suffering from post-operative urinary incontinence. Here, uh, I have summarized four strategies to maximally prevent urinary incontinence during uh, whole lap. First, the mucosal incision should be made sufficiently early before you start to fully enucleate lateral lobes. The mucosal incision is created bilaterally, initially, in both sides of the Vermontanum. These incisions can be easily extended more distally to deep, even deep bulbous urethral area to as a form of a, a long mucosal tear while you continue to fully enucleate the lateral lobe. Uh, this can damage the whole urethral mucosal integrity over the urethral sphincter. Second, the formation of bilateral mucosal wings at the prosthetic apex. This helps you to identify the uh, boundary of the circular sphincter structure clearly and easily at five to uh, seven o'clock position at the prosthetic apical area. Third, the starting point of a 12 o'clock inverted V-shaped mucosal incision should be way proximal to the sphincter so that you can avoid the direct a sphincter damage at the apex in 12 o'clock position. This point is very important. I will show you 
uh, uh, using my surgical video later. Four, uh, careful preservation of the uh, mucosal tissue around the USR sphincter. Never make any mucosal incision against the circular sphincter tissue. Instead, you can make an incision at more medial position over the uh, prostatic adenoma. So collectively, my uh, surgical technique can be described as a so-called uh, early inverted v shape uh, apical mucosal incision or EBAMI technique. The surgical technique I do is as follows. Basically, uh, I'm applying the classical three lobe technique. Uh, first, I find the uh, capsular plane by making a small incisions on both sides of the peromontanum. Then a uh, longitudinal incision is made at the bladder neck in uh, five o'clock and seven o'clock positions to remove the median lobe. Then uh, each lateral lobe near the both side of the peromontanum can be lifted upward to form mucosal wing. Uh, from peromontanum, the scope is slightly withdrawn distally to make an uh, inverted V-shape incision starting from uh, 12 o'clock position. The start point marked as uh, X here should be more proximally sufficiently away from the apex as I mentioned earlier. Uh, preserving mucosal uh, 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 tissue uh, overlying each lateral lobe is uh, uh, better to maintain the mucosal coaptation. Then the lateral lobe is enucleated upward to gradually reach the travel clock. Apart from uh, this, the longitudinal vertical incision along the uh, travel clock position is made to find the capsular plane of the left lobe. Then sweeping the left lobe downward. Uh, two planes, enucleated planes are met at the prostatic apical area. After conjoining, uh, you can go on uh, enucleating entire uh, left lobe toward uh, bladder neck to push the left lobe into the bladder space. The same procedure goes for the right lobe. I will show you my uh, sphincter saving technique uh, using my surgery video. Also, there are more un unedited surgical videos on uh, YouTube. So you are free to enjoy watching uh, these videos. Overall, I follow the three lobe technique. The median lobe is removed first and then the left lobe and finally the right lobe. The three lobe technique is most a traditional technique for whole lab. The first thing to do is to find the surgical plane between adenoma and the prostatic capsule. Longitudinal incisions on both sides of the peromontanum is made to identify the plane. Then the median lobe is enucleated by making a longitudinal incision at the five and seven o'clock direction from the bladder neck to the initial incision made lateral to vermontanum. Continue to enucleate the median lobe proximally to the bladder neck. Median lobe is now placed in the bladder. The second step is to form mucosal wings of both lobes at the prostatic apex. Bilateral lobes are lifted up in turn using the tip of the scope. This step makes the prostatic lobes separate from the sphincter structure. Still, both the prostate and sphincter are covered together with the same mucosal surface. The next step is to make a longitudinal mucosal incision at the bladder neck. This incision is extended bilaterally to both sides.
The next step is an inverted V-shape incision. Return to the prostatic apex and check the mucosal ring bilaterally. Then make a downward incision at the mucosal layer from 12 o'clock start point with an imaginary line connecting the upper start point and the lower mucosal ring. This is an inverted V-shaped incision. At this point, it is important to note that the start point of the mucosal incision at 12 o'clock must be located deep proximally. The same goes for the right lobe. The start point of the mucosal incision at 12 o'clock is slightly distal to the initial 12 o'clock longitudinal incision made previously at the bladder neck. It is very safe to make a vertical connecting incision at the 12 o'clock position between the bladder neck and the start point distally. Then the vertical incision should be widened. Continue to enucleate the left lobe by sweeping the left lobe along the surgical plane towards 12 o'clock direction. The next step is the conjoining of the two surgical planes at the prostatic apical area. The two planes are previous 12 o'clock longitudinal incision and the plane made by the upward enucleation of the left lobe. Continue to enucleate the left lobe in proximal direction towards bladder neck. Create a surgical plane by pushing the left lobe using the tip of the scope. All incisions in the proximal directions are safe once you left the prostatic apical area. Enucleation proceeds toward the bladder neck. The next step is the right lobe as well. After completing dissection up to 10 o'clock position, slightly pull out the endoscope. You will be able to observe the entire area of the incision to be made. Align the level of a transverse mucosal incision at 10 to 12 o'clock area with the opposite margin of the left lobe. Note that the circular sphincter tissue should not be touched at the 12 o'clock position of the prostatic apical area. Sphincter injuries are most likely to occur at the 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock position of the prostatic apex because the margin of the sphincter and the distal margin of the prostate gland are ambiguous. Therefore, if the surgery is performed while confirming the sphincter margin accurately at this site, the incidence of stress incontinence can be minimized as much as possible. The right lobe is also pushed into the bladder while enucleation proceeds toward the bladder neck. In summary, to avoid urinary incontinence after whole lap, mucosal tissue around the retral sphincter should be preserved very carefully. Mucosal incisions should be made sufficiently early before starting to fully enucleate lateral lobes. Bilateral mucosal wings at the prostatic apex can be formed for easier identification over the lower border of the sphincter. The start point at 12 o'clock mucosal incision during the inverted V-shaped incision should be placed much proximal to the sphincter. Thank you for watching this video. Professor Oh, thank you very much for the, for the very nice presentation and also the very nice video that you have just shown us. So um, I would like to know, because for worldwide, um, enucleation procedure is not actually you know, the, the commonest BP surgery, uh, mainly due to the difficulty in learning and also the learning curve, of course. Um, I believe your trainees and your residents would have a much shorter learning curve, 
but in your center, how many cases um, do the residents need to learn under your supervision before they can independently do a whole lab surgery? Yes, uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, yeah, learning curve issue is the most uh, 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 greatest disadvantage of a whole lab uh, technique. But uh, uh, I think it's the same uh, in uh, when you first uh, try the laparoscopic surgery or the robotic surgery. I think it's the same, uh, same learning curve. So in my residence, uh, actually, I think uh, around uh, uh, 15 cases will be sufficient or to, uh, to overcome uh, the learning curve because uh, uh, the definition of uh, overcoming learning curve is, uh, uh, I think, is different from the uh, researchers. And actually, I published the two uh, papers uh, regarding the learning curve issue on, in the whole lab. And uh, I found that the, the uh, surgical technique or the efficiency of enucleation uh, reached the plateau after 12, five, uh, uh, 25 uh, cases of uh, whole lab surgery. But uh, uh, I think it's more important uh, when you feel comfortable with the, the surgery. Personally, I reached the uh, around uh, 13 cases. So I think the younger urologists can learn more quickly. So I think the 15 cases will be sufficient for the beginners to feel that the surgery is comfortable. Yeah. Mm, I see. Thank you. So, but uh, so, the surgery should be uh, should be uh, placed in uh, consecutive regularly. So, if you uh, try the whole lab surgery uh, like uh, today and two months later another case, it's uh, not very effective in uh, overcoming learning curve. So, the case should be placed uh, very closely, uh, like uh, one case this week and next case uh, next week, at least uh, one or two cases in a week. So maybe it's a quicker way to overcoming the learning curve. I see. Mm -hmm. So uh, you mentioned about uh, using the Yuvami technique that you pioneered and also that um, uh, your cont early incontinence rate is actually extremely low. So uh, uh, what are the rates of um, early incontinence after uh, using this technique, as you have said, especially like in the first one to three months, because uh, in uh, my uh, limited experience and also in my center, um, early incontinence is actually um, one issue that some patients might not uh, want to do, uh, get this option. And actually some colleagues are not very keen to offer because we are not as experienced as you. So uh, w when you're very experienced, so what's your uh, early incontinence rate uh, in the first one to three months? Yeah, uh, I uh, actually uh, performed the urodynamic studies routinely uh, the, uh, to the patient uh, who is uh, scheduled to uh, do the whole lab surgery. Before making the decision of the surgery, I usually uh, perform the urodynamic study and uh, afterwards, uh, I uh, actually asked a lot of patients uh, whether they have a uh, urinary incontinence. And I found that the, a lot of uh, uh, patients actually suffer from the, not just urinary incontinence, but the uh, urgent urinary incontinence. Because uh, when you uh, have a huge uh, adenoma, uh, and then uh, during the, the last uh, many years, uh, patients usually uh, undergo the decompensation or compensation uh, uh, um, process uh, to the, the enlarged process. So bladder undergoes the, the, the functional uh, alteration, significant functional alteration. So I found a lot of patients have the involuntary tetrus contraction uh, before surgery. So uh, once you uh, remove the whole uh, prostate adenoma and the, the balance between the bladder and the outlet resistance is uh, broken. So the, the bladder factor will be more dominant. So that makes uh, the patient uh, uh, experience urgent genetic incontinence. Also, there's some uh, 
patient who suffer the stress in the incontinence, but over time, it's uh, uh, a lot of patients, uh, the problem is uh, temporary. So over the three months or four months, the, uh, gradually the uh, stress in the incontinence or the urgent urinary incontinence goes away. And it, uh, finally, I usually follow the patient up to uh, six months postoperatively. And uh, I usually find the most patients are satisfied with the uh, uh, surgical result and also the, uh, they do not complain uh, the urinary incontinence anymore at the uh, postoperative six months. So I think the uh, preoperative uh, consultation uh, so the patient is also very important. Uh, if you do uh, the eurodynamic study and you get the findings, and then you can uh, explain the findings to the patient before surgery, and that makes the, the uh, patient uh, uh, relieved uh, from the, uh, the incontinence, pre or over the incontinence. I see. So in that case, if there would be a considerable um, percentage of patients having urge incontinence after the whole lap, uh, not purely stress, would you give routine uh, anticholinergic drugs for the patients or? Uh, yes, uh, very good question. I do not usually prescribe the anticholinergics to all patients, but uh, very selected patients. So I see. Uh, especially in the early postoperative period, like uh, 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 second week, uh, two uh, two weeks after the surgery, to around, around one or two months. I think that's enough. Yes. Hmm. So uh, maybe the last question. So uh, now there are newer uh, homium laser machines uh, in the past few years, and they have been more powerful. Um, uh, are you using the latest machines, or are you still using the lower watts? What's the power of the homium that you are using? Yes. Uh, Yes, actually, uh, the new machine has uh, just installed in my uh, hospital, so National oh, University Hospital, because the introduction of the uh, 120 watts machine uh, has been delayed due to the, the uh, uh, technological problems in the mm. uh, between the Korean uh, the uh, government and also the company, but uh, just installed, and uh, I actually used the. Uh, we have 120 watts for uh, two months, and I also apply Moses te uh, technology to prosthetic surgery. But I found that the with the long pulse uh, energy, I think it's very helpful because uh, it uh, helps me to coagulate uh, the bleeding vessels more efficiently, so uh, less bleeding. I think it, it, it's a, that's a great merit merit and. But the short short purse, it's uh, I think it's the same with the the 100 watts, the old machine, and the Moses technology, it's uh, uh, something like uh, very similar to that of uh, the long purse mode. Uh, so overall, I think the 120 watts is uh, uh, more improved and helpful. So I but uh, I don't use uh, 120 watts, but I usually use used to use uh, 80 watts, that is uh, two joule by uh, 40 hertz. I think that's, uh, I think in, in, term of the, in terms of the power, I think it's, uh, 80 watts will be sufficient to perform any uh, cases of whole lab. I see. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor O, for your uh, very um, uh, nice video and also your comments. So, um, so thank you very much. And we'll really want to meet face-to-face uh, -face, uh, very soon uh, when um, the COVID will end. <laughs> so uh, thank you very you. much, Professor Oh. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having me today. <laughs>